talented, yet overlooked. Gifted, but then forgotten. These are the stories, the unsung heroes of Māori music. You give them a mic and a stage and 5,000 people, it was rocking. Not only great imitators, but we were also great innovators. The amount of talent that came through the Ratana phenomena was incredible. The country was starving for culture and music at that time. The brass bands were the Avengers of the Ratana movement. Military brass bands in Auckland during the 1850s introduced Māori to Western music. Though different, Western music appealed to the Māori musical ear, and by the 1900s, brass bands could be found in marae around the country. In the Waikato, Princess Tupuya would form her entertainment troupe, Poa Mangatafi, under the King Tanga in the 1920s. Te <laughs> They played dual roles, ne? I do tahi na ratu tu yo. Tu tahi ne hari kite kimi pute. Na na no i fakatu i te po manga tafiri te hari ki kingaro rohe kato na iwi kite kimi pute i fakatu i te marae ne. Tahi tu ratu ki tahi toko rau ngati poro poneke ai i fe no tu ra. Na <laughs> I am the pen of the Ratana. I am the pen of the Ratana. I am the pen of the As the sounds of Tupo and Mangatafiti flowed down the Waikato River, on the west coast, the Ponganui River also flowed with musical riches from its own brass bands. Tahu Portiki Wido Muratana had begun to use brass bands to spearhead his campaign to unite Māori. Seeing his people in the doldrums and recognising that ultimately this was due to the cruelty of the treaty, Muratana put heart and mind to solving the problems of the Māori world as he saw it. The history goes back into uh, the early culture of our people. Our papa supported kapahaka, he supported uh, Motaiaha. Um, he had those schools operating at Ratanapa in the early days. Uh, but then he went on a world tour and his eyes were open. In America he saw brass bands. In England he saw brass bands. Uh, he had a, an orchestra that went with him on the tour. 
they toured the world spreading the gospel. They used to use the music to attract people and behind, behind the music was the real message was the gospel. Those guys uh, would look at the best and the highest uh, musicians that were in England, that were in Europe, that were in uh, America, and bring all those teachings back to the bar. And of course, everybody grabbed onto it. When he arrived home, he uh, dedicated about 10 years to developing Māori music amongst the On Marais, amongst our iwi and our hapu. His key goal was to try to unite our Māori people first. So he did it through sports, after sports, kapahaka, after kapahaka, music. Rātana have provided a very powerful message for all Māori. Irrespective of tribal social standing, his was a message of hope for all. Rātana and his movement soon became the symbol for pan-tribal unity. He always had music wherever he went, on his, on his tours. Um, he always took the reo with him. He actually brought together the best musicians there were in the whole country from every part of the nation. And they uh, arrived in Rātana in the early 1920s. And from 20s through to the early 30s, he had developed a Ngāti Parau feel, a Kahanunu feel, a Ngāti Whātua feel, and they merged all of those tribal fields together to form what we call Te Reo. Rātana's political success with the Labour Party it secured for them all four Māori seats is well known. It's now part of New Zealand's political folklore. It is little known, however, Rātana himself was responsible for setting up a musical dynasty that is unparalleled in the annals of New Zealand history. The Rātana brass bands, and he called them Te Reo. To join the Reo was a lot of commitment, and to, to maintain your, your your stand in it, it was very hard. The music beginning for me was in Te Reo, o Te Arepa, the brass band, the Ratana brass bands. There we, we, we learned scales, how to read music, cratchits, quavers, and all those dots on there in the lines was the priority. You know that inside out, you can play anything. We were brought up to not only learn church music, hymns, etc., and the formation of marches and learning the formulas of minor major chords and the construction of melodies, etc., and how to build chords. And I think that's been a strong attribute of Ratana, which is also transferred to the choir and the singing. Ratana could do little wrong during this era. He provided hope for his followers and music to empower their dreams. Here was someone they could believe in and trust, and he was equal to the expectations. Sadly, in 1939, Tahu Portiki Wirumu Ratana passed away. Māreo continued to flourish long beyond the death of their leader, largely due to an unwritten rule that once you become involved in the Morihu movement, you automatically become a player in te reo, or a voice in the choir. I was a boy brought up here in Ratna here by my auntie and uncle and um, the very first stages, uh, she put me in the brass band. We Here, you're either choir boy or, or brass band boy, and uh, she put me in the brass band. I thought, my God, what is she doing? In the par, we had all the teachers. We had a couple of uncles up the road who taught us how to play sax. We had a couple of uncles down the road who knew how to play the guitar. We had the drummers, you had everything. And Ratana brass band leaders had special teaching methods to ensure their players didn't forget their music lessons. The patu. The discipline in those days was far different to what it is now. Like, like, 
It was almost physical abuse. When your kids, you're putting fingers over here, you're looking at elsewhere and you're getting smacked on the fingers mate, with a screwdriver and on the ears. So you definitely, and I'm looking at my mates. How am I gonna... Learn your stuff so you don't get the same thing that your mate got, you know? I can say yes, they were hard tutors, but those times, what they taught us meant a lot. And it, it prepared us not only just to be in, in, the, in the reel, won the band, but prepared us for life. But it was in, in the pursuit of musical perfection. Everybody was learning it, and in and, and those days hardly anybody went to school, you know. But they learned how to play those instruments. I, I think the real brass band will always be the same, always be there, that learning institution. Te reo is always our foundation, always. And, and with all of us who, who, who are musicians, when we go back to the pa, we always be, become a part of te reo and will always be members of te reo. Ratna likened te reo to the holy trumpets that blew down the walls of Jericho. He used them to blow away the devil and free his people from all evil. Ngā reo, katoa, arapa o ma kapiriwiri tua hamoera, tua toru, tua hine, te whai o te katoa. Their job is to decipher and get rid of all these unseen things. It is the message that clears the way and allows the morihu to go and preach what they have to do. It served a number of purposes, having the reo, because uh, you must remember that he was travelling from marae to marae to marae. There was a lot of... Uh, um, light, but there was also a lot of darkness. It's, it's used to destroy the powers of darkness, evil. Uh, the power of the tongue is in the old days. Ratna had a vision that this, this band, this reel, would go around the country and get rid of all bad tohungism and, and all the bad tapu that were hurting our people. Uh, Ratna wasn't against all tohunga, he was against tohunga uh, in terms of mate Māori, in terms of mākutu, in terms of uh, uh, kehua, uh, you know. He believed that uh, if something harmed us and it was not good for us, then it was his job to rid our people of those curses. Today, Ratna is receiving a facelift in more than one way. A brand new band leader, possibly the youngest ever, took over the Te Arepa band based at Ratana just this year. He explains how he sees his new calling. The reo and, and the brass band here has always been my life. Um, I feel I have a, a big job in hand. I feel that I have a job that I have to get all the musicians together and play for, for God. With Te Reo leading the way, Ngā Morihu were empowered and prepared to confront anything the world threw at them. At the same time, there was different influences coming in and um, you had another school of musicians here who were very good uh, readers and writers. We were great, not only great imitators, but we were also great innovators. And when radio and television came into our communities, of course, that opened up to uh, opened us up to another scope of sound and music. Music worldwide underwent radical changes during the 1950s and reached even greater heights in the 1960s. Ratana joined the trend, and in the 1970s they added to their own musical revolution. The band leader in charge uh, at, at Ratna Pao was a great jazz musician himself, and he was mo he modelled his music on the, on the music of uh, Count Basie, uh, Duke Ellington, and the big band sound, you see, so um, uh, that's the type of environment that, that was happening. As the brass and silver were developing, 
There was another organization at Ratna Park, it was called the Ratna Musicians Club. The Ratna Musicians Club was a mixture of, 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 of our tribes from all over the country. And it wasn't church music. They were developing new tunes. And the Ratna Musicians Club was feared by all the great musicians around New Zealand. When you talk about the Ratana musicians and the Ratana musicians club, all I could see was all these incredible jazz musicians and they were Māori. I was reading how they made their drum set, they killed the sheep and all they had was the surround bit for the drum. They killed the sheep and cured the skin and put over, that was their drum. The Vartana Musicians Club was set up in the 1970s. A new musical dawn had arrived. As you know, during the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s and up to the 60s, the dance culture amongst our people was phenomenal. And they had about nine big bands, and the big bands played the modern music. And during that period, we had a what we call the Mātoro, which was a huge fundraising venture campaign that lasted for three to seven years around the country, fundraising for our manua and for a lot of the facilities. So we took a brass band, a big band, a kapaka team, and a Hawaiian thing, all in one. And we toured for this building, it costs oh, a, few, a few thousand. Three years on the road, every weekend, with our families on the bus, gone. The music revolution leapt forward. It soon began to turn out some of the hottest musos around. Bands like the Remnant Set broke tradition and started playing different styles of music. My generation growing up, the major bands inside coming out of Ratana Pa was definitely like the Ratana Remnant Set, and that was from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And the Remnant Set were part of the legacy of the Māori show bands. They became one of the spearheads of, of the bands down there, one of the main bands down there, the Remnant Set, and they became quite well known but they didn't win the Battle of the Bands. In the mid-70s, we played more of the Chicago, Blood, Sweat and Tears, the brass stuff. And as time went on in the late 70s, the music changed a bit when the funk started coming in. The band was put together just to keep the interest of our young people. Music was a very integral part of the Ratna Hai. The Ratna knew the importance of the music attracting the youth. The revolution had begun. Ratana Pa was to go down in history as a launching pad for musos all over the country. January the 25th became a hot date on calendars all over the country as musicians would converge on Ratana Pa on this day each year to celebrate this new dawn. The 25th of January, they would have the big uh, festival every year. They used to have a stage outside built up on boxes, whole lot of bits of wood, platform built, put on boxes, and that was the stage outside. That was the main event where they'd have uh, bands come over from all over the, the country, all these Māori bands. The likes of, of, of Delvanius. I mean, people don't realise Delvanius' connection with our music and the music industry and the Ratna movement. But we had old guys like Pavlo and them. And these guys were beautiful musicians. They, they, were, uh, they were entertainers, natural born entertainers. You give them a mic and a stage and 5,000 people, and, and boy, it was rocky. We used to learn, you know, from, from those guys playing and they used to have the talent quest and everything like that. And we used to learn off these guys, you know, it was just very magical. They, they could turn a ukulele and, and, and it would be better than a, than, than, than a Gibson guitar. Thank you. 
rock guitarist at the time with the big screaming guitars and all that, we took that off Billy TK. Billy TK did something interesting. Uh, at about uh, midnight, um, he gets on the stage with his crew and everybody's getting sleepy. Uh, and then Bill does something amazing. That was the Sinners Band, which, which had started to learn uh, the first uh, Hendrix album. And uh, we'd, we'd, we'd been experimenting with feedback. I saw him and he was doing these mm, pretty things in Hendrix and all that. I said, whoa, who's that guy? What's that noise he doing? First time we've ever heard uh, Jimi Hendrix played live. And uh, Billy was a magic guitarist. You could have sworn it was Hendrix on the stage at Ratana that, that morning. I remember the, the look on the people's faces, you know, like, what, a, what, what kind of sound is this, you know? It's all distorted and it's screaming at you and it's, it's doing all these crazy things, you know? The old guys were absolutely terrified. You know, the, you know, the more traditionalist part of the run, the Chesica, what kind of record is that? And there's old Billy giving it heaps on the main stage at Ratner in front of 5,000 people early in the morning playing this Jimi Hendrix music. But he revolutionised it because all the young guys heard it and they saw it and they wanted to copy Billy. So a lot of our early guitarists, they always see Billy as their co martyr They always treat him with great respect because he did something that revolutionised and he did something without fear. He just got up there, banged it out, and it changed music that rub. Today, Ratna's musicians continue to influence modern music. Ruya Perahame has carved a pathway for himself that draws on his early musical training. Well, as an 18, 8 year old, I left the park. I was excited because I was only exposed to Māori and perhaps going to Whanganui, Pākehā, because I also grew up out of the Ratana Brass Bands, the Whanganui Garrison Band. And it's funny because that's a colonial brass band in Whanganui, and he's these Māoris learning how to play brass band music with these colonials. But I loved it because I saw their love and passion amongst Pākehā people for music, putting aside the, cult, the, the history. The passion and love I saw amongst Pākehā people for music, that's what I fell in love with. But it's not just the musical training that has helped shape Ruya's sound. Throughout his career as an artist, Ruya has continued to hold strong to the values and beliefs of his Ratana teachings. I, I can't talk about Southside of Bombay without referring to What's the Time, Mr. Wolf. And uh, certainly What's the Time, Mr. Wolf, again, is influenced by my upbringing as Ratana. And the, some of the subliminal messages under it are a lot to do with the prophecies. I just want to touch on it that as a creative writer and a person, we draw on different aspects to inspire us. When the water falls down the hill, it's silent. You put a rock in front of it, the water won't stop. It'll just find another way of... It'll just find another pathway. So the potential of our history of where we've come from, where we're heading to, where we are right now, is as silent as the water trickling down the hill. If anybody wants to partake of drinking that water, they're more than welcome. If people want to disregard it or overlook it, that's their loss. But the potential at the end when the water gets to the bottom and fills a pool to provide for everybody, well, at the end of the day, I let the future generations uh, uh, claim the opportunity in there for tomorrow. Today, despite the flowering of many different musical styles, Te Reo remained the bedrock of Ratana music. As we have just seen, brass bands opened the door to the possibilities of Western music. Out of all Hinamutu, our next guests walked through that door to help take Māori music to a new level with their own brand of the X Factor. 
they would tie in Rim Deep Pool. Drift away above the sand. 